Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, it's Jonathan Goldhill and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. Today's guest is Jack Tompkins, a business analyst, consultant, and entrepreneur. Jack is the owner of Pineapple Consulting Firm based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and absolutely loves helping small businesses become data-driven. Originally from Connecticut, Jack spent years after college in corporate America with roles ranging from analyst to partnership manager, but moved down to Charlotte and started his company, Pineapple Consulting Firm. He and his team help small businesses become more data-driven by creating KPIs, key performance indicators. Dash, those are dashboards with visual representations of their performance, along with analytical support to fully tell the story of their business. I could not enjoy this subject more. I'm a, such a big believer that you have to not only measure what matters, to quote John Doerr, but you also have to have visibility to the KPIs, and that's how you hold people accountable. Jack, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I couldn't agree more. Very excited to talk about this stuff. I know we get along already talking KPIs and stuff, so I'm, yeah, I'm so, excited. Yeah, so what's up with it? You know, that people don't like us, that we're analysts, you know, that we're analytical, <laughs> that we want to know, like, you know, um, you know, too many small businesses um, just focus on the profit and loss and just like, am I making money? And, and like, that is missing the boat. That is a lagging indicator. That's an after the fact, it's the, you know, the ship has sailed type of thing. We have to know what the leading indicators are. And these are why we use KPI so we can know how we're doing. Right. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're just starting out, revenue and profits, great, right? But once you get a feel of it, the leading indicators kind of take charge, mm -hmm. right? So the revenue and profit are the result of all the actions, as you kind of mentioned. Yep. But looking ahead of what's coming, what's the sales cycle look like? How many leads are we getting in marketing, et cetera, et cetera? All that stuff can project out your future, which helps you forecast, which helps you budget, and yep. all this other stuff. So it, it kind of it's funny how the leading indicators kind of set the pace for the lagging indicators, which are the result of everything. So it's, yeah, I, yeah. you got to look at both. Yeah. And it's not just stuff that ends up on the profit and loss statement. It's also stuff that ends up on the balance sheet and right. basically, you know, the cash in the bank. And right. so it it's one thing, a lot of um, business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, they look at indicators and they focus on sales and marketing indicators only. They don't focus on operating metrics. Like uh, let's talk about a few of those. They don't talk, they don't focus on maybe some other financial metrics. There are so many ratios that you could be following in finance. That would be important. What, right. what are a few of your favorites? I'll, then I'll share a few of mine. Favorite in the financial sector. Um, so I like, I like looking at some particular expenses, honestly. Um, and obviously a big one is always going to be payroll and things like that. But right. Labor, for, for like sure. Right. For things like the restaurant industry, any sort of retail, obviously payroll is huge there. Um, and the whole prime rate and everything like that. So mm -hmm. um, any business is going to have that. And if your payroll is growing, not necessarily a bad thing, as long as your revenue and profit kind of reflect that. 
your payroll is growing and your revenue and profit are not, or specifically your profit is not, uh, could be an issue there. So whatever big expense is kind of the number one thing, and it could be marketing expense too, or anything like that. Yep. Um, keep an eye on those because as they grow, it's not necessarily a bad thing unless your profit doesn't grow with it. Yeah. So our, as coaches and consultants, marketing is one of our largest expenses. And so we need to be retracting that in relationship to our revenue or, or gross profit if we've got people that are delivering the work. But in in a labor driven business, service business, I work with a lot of construction companies, trades, you know, restaurants, then labor as a percentage of your total revenue um, or even better yet of your gross profit, which would be after your material costs are super important numbers to track. And I, I think you could track them and like in a restaurant business, you could maybe track, you could track it on a daily basis. Um, most of my clients track it on a weekly basis. Yeah. And I, I think weekly is pretty standard for something like that. Yep. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but all the more important to have something that's repeatable or even automated to be able to see the data come in weekly and have it refreshed. And, and so you can actually make decisions on a weekly basis too. Yeah. So how, how else can we drum this into business owners' heads that <laughs> it's really meaningful to have a data-driven company? Um, yeah. yeah. What do you, you know, what do you tell people when they're, when you're in maybe a sales appointment and they are, they're just not sure if it's worth the investment or they're, you know, I mean, how, how do you get them over the edge and say, you know, like, this is where your ROI is. Well, so it's funny you mentioned ROI. That was going to exactly be my answer. Cause I'm obviously a very analytical person. So if the numbers make sense to me, then there's a strong case to do it. Right. So that's kind of when I'm not like trying to convince anybody, but just when I'm talking about it, like, hey, if you invested in a dashboard or if you became a bit more data-driven, let's say at the very most, maybe it's five grand, maybe it's 10 grand or something like that. But if that helps you save 15 grand or make mm -hmm. better decisions, so you make an extra 20 grand or something, mm -hmm. the ROI is kind of a no-brainer. And then that data-driven investment, if you will, a little bit of a time investment involved, of course. Mm -hmm. The monetary investment could probably be bigger. Um, but then you're good. Then, I mean, it's going to be ongoing, but the bulk of it is upfront. So then you're just making the extra 20 grand or whatever every week, every month, whatever it is. So the ROI over time is, is hard to argue with. So, you know, I'm going to dumb this down uh, for people who understand sports. Um, this is money ball. Yes. Money ball for businesses. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not intimately familiar with the movie. I did see it once a long time ago, but it was based on statistics, um, yep. statistics of batters and and pitchers, and uh, you know how they did with things like runners in scoring position. Um, you know, there's so much data that they have on baseball players mm -hmm. that the analogy to me is the simple scoreboard is what's in the stadium that you're seeing as the game is progressing. Um, but the real data behind, you know, under the dashboard or the hood is the the incredible amount of data on each player versus you know, a, a batter, how he performs against left-handed pitchers, right-handed pitchers against historically against the pitcher that's on the mound. I mean, right. this is incredible information that managers have at their fingertips. I don't know how much they use it in real time, but I'm sure they, they look at this data from time to time. They, they've got to, because it's what's going to help ball players get better. I mean, this is the same thing in business. It's money ball. Yeah, no, it's exactly, and you're totally talking, I'm a diehard baseball fan. I'm a Yankee fan, which I think just separated the entire audience into two groups, but, <laughs> but yes. it's Boston true. Red Sox fans and Yankees right. fans and people who don't follow baseball at all. Right. That's the third group. Um, but it's so true. And you see this even in like football too, they're going for fourth and two a lot more often mm -hmm. in baseball. They're taking out a hitter because they want the better matchup of lefty versus righty, even if the yep. hitter has three hits in the game and, that sort of analytics, I know it's kind of the new agey type thing in sports. It is not that new agey in business. It is how successful businesses have been running for a long time. It's now kind of 
I shouldn't say trickling, but kind of trickling down into the small businesses and entrepreneurs and becoming a lot more accessible there, which uh, is the whole point of my business, but also just really exciting uh, for the industry in whole. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Just had a thought here. Um, and I'm trying to think of a story, a case study where a company, because of its leading indicators, um, made some pivots or changes or like had an incredible outcome. And I, I do have a small story because so uh, it just came right. up in my head and it's a video that is going to be on the homepage of my new website. It is on my current website and it talks about the value of employee engagement and okay. some studies that was done by, I think it was McKinsey um, or no, it was the Gallup group that yeah. talked about um, shareholder returns of public companies and how much greater they were when employee engagement was high. So folks, as an example, a leading indicator would be high employee engagement where people are really excited to come to work and love the company they're working for. And the results are that the profits, the balance sheet are so much greater. Yeah. Jack, can you think of a story maybe from your client base that the leading indicators have really dramatically changed the outlook of, of your client's thinking? Yeah, I've got one coming to mind for sure. Um, it was basically, so kind of like a architectural engineering type firm. Um, and they have obviously longer projects. There's a whole lot involved in, in mm -hmm. making a new building of any sort. And so this was a company that wasn't super data driven, um, very focused on the architecture, but really, really knew that it was important. So what we did is a whole bunch of things, but the leading indicator part was how long do we have work for given what is currently in the pipeline? So mm -hmm. it's today's work, tomorrow's work, and then everything in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So the pipeline ended up being like, I forget exactly. I think it was like eight or nine months out. Mm. And so it was a huge eye opener of, holy crap, we're good for the next eight months. Let's start making some changes that are more favorable to us. Maybe we can say no to a project that we don't really want to do. Maybe you can raise our hourly rate. And they did both of those. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to catch up with them again um, and talk actually about this piece of it. But I'm betting that they're a whole lot happier because they're doing the projects that they love, not even just the ones that they like, the projects they love. They know they're good for the next eight months. And that's perpetually elongating. It's, it's eight months today. It's eight months still next month because um, they're bringing in the right projects. So they ended up bringing in more money, a lot happier and a lot more secure and knowing that they were still good for call it the next year, realistically. That's one of my favorite metrics is what is your sales pipeline or, you know, work in progress pipeline look like? And mm -hmm. um, I do find that many of my clients are challenged with trying to figure it out. And uh, so sometimes I tell them the easiest thing to do is just sort of map it out on a calendar, the number of days that you have and, and maybe count up by crews or work days or, um, you know, or, or hours, mm -hmm. um, and then divide it by whatever the denominator would be to give you, you know, an idea of how much work you have. And so clients, many, most of my clients today have well more than six weeks, which seems to be a pretty comfortable amount of a, a pipeline but when they have less it's it's challenging and gosh i have an architectural firm i'm working with right now and they've been challenged with building that pipeline and having to get that far out but yeah that's a great one i, I love it yeah no, the sales pipeline's big and it uh like i said it gives you a whole lot of confidence when you can see oh i've got a lot of work coming that's good <laughs> right and it's a great time to be able to test raising your prices and see whether uh you know, things change. Right, um, exactly. I, I'll, I'll dig a little deeper on this. What I really like about the sales pipeline is that if you track it on a regular basis, and let's just say weekly for the moment, um, you can start to have an advanced indicator as to whether the economy is slowing down, whether yeah. people are tightening their wallets. I mean, look, we see this in real estate when, and we, and everyone sees it in real estate when they hear you, you they hear like, you know, how many, um, how much is it in inventory in terms of available homes to buy on the market? 
um, how fast things are turning. I mean, these are important metrics and watching those when they change or watching what happens to interest rates when it goes up. Because, yeah. if you know, certainly if you're in the trades, that's going to affect your business as well. Right. And even take that to the macro level, looking at kind of futures, futures prices, right? In the mm-hmm. stock world, in the commodities mm-hmm. market, I guess that would be. Yeah. But things like that, it's all these kind of leading indicators in the manufacturer indexes, um, all leading indicators of what the consensus is, what do people see? If you take that down to the kind of the small business level, you don't have to go pull a bunch of people through University of Michigan's research department or anything like that. You can kind of ballpark it. And I think it's okay. Normally I'm very data-driven and would say don't ballpark it, but in something like this, like get a good feel for it, run some numbers to your point earlier. We've got five jobs and they're all a hundred hours each. And we each work whatever, an average of 40 billable hours a week or whatever. Yep. So whatever that average is out to, we've got that much. And it's not going to be exact, but it still kind of gives you that confidence and gives you that foresight for the next few weeks. Great. All right. So um, I want to turn this next part of the show to a visual part of the show. Okay. And so for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, you'll get the benefit. Or if you're listening, go jump on YouTube so you can see what we're about to share. Um, Jack, you, Jack, you've got a coffee cup on your uh, next to your pineapples, which I guess is all about pineapple consulting firm. Yes. Love the logo on the shirt. It says, relax, I've got a spreadsheet for that. <laughs> so I, I use uh, a scorecard. Um, I use traction tools. It's part of the EOS uh, system. I think it mm-hmm. really helps my clients uh, see things visually. You're using Excel, Tableau, Google Data Studio. Can you share with our viewers um, some of what you're using and, and what, you know, maybe the pros and cons or, or why you like them, or, I mean, I didn't even know Google had something called data studio. So yeah. uh, I'm a big fan of Google. I think that they make really easy to use uh, products that are mostly free. So is that a free program for most it people? Is, it is free. Yep. Oh my gosh. It is free. It is great. I, uh, so let's start there, I guess. Um, I guess, let me share my screen and we'll kind of dive in, but great. Um, as I'm going through this and especially for the audio only listeners, I'll, I'll try and do some, um, some recap as we're going through it. Mm -hmm. But, um, so Google data studio, uh, if you're not familiar, whoops. Um, as I do that, it crashes. That's the benefit of doing things live. Right. Right. Of course. Um, (laughs) Wow. There we go. Presentation mode. Okay. Yep. So Google Data Studio is, it's a, it's a data visualization tool. Mm-hmm. So think the fanciest Excel dashboard or graph or set of visuals that you've ever seen. Uh, Google Data Studio does that and uh, does a lot of things with uh, online integrations. Think like APIs and things like that for data flow. Right. Um, so let's be clear to the listeners that what we're looking at are website analytics. So um, for anyone who has Google Analytics, they've seen uh, geographic maps, they've seen sources of traffic, uh, sessions and monthly trends, uh, page views. Um, so this I would I'd come to expect from Google in terms of web. Do they offer yeah. something else that's beyond website analytics where you totally. actually can build a scorecard? Yeah. Yeah. So this is just step one. This is most okay. people are familiar with Google Analytics. I'm not mm-hmm. a huge fan of their interface. Mm -hmm. Um, this is something that I put together for my website that it shows the KPIs that I want. It shows the actual sessions trend that I want to see, shows the different pages, how I want to see them. So it's a lot of just customization there. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to have to refresh that one. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Let's verify it's me while that one's loading. Here's a YouTube one. So again, kind of similar story to, um, the Google analytics one, Mm -hmm. but Select is this video. automatically driven or is yep. this something you've customized as well? Uh, so I custom made this, right? Uh, but the data does flow in every 12 hours. And again, for the audio only folks, I've got views, average watch time and average view percentages, kind of mm. my main KPIs. Mm-hmm. Then I've got views by state and then I break it out by video um, with some metrics by each one of those. And then right. um, can select a specific video to mm-hmm. see the trend over... I guess that looks like maybe 30 days or so. That's great. 
Yeah, it's a lot of customizations. Mm-hmm. I've done one with ad data too. So YouTube ads data, mm-hmm. bring in that. What's the cost per click? What's the mm-hmm. cost per conversion? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have multiple multiple steps in the funnel, you can get that cost too. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, this is really useful. I've not seen this uh, in a YouTube presentation before. Yeah. Um, um, it would be good to know because uh, I know I'm po- we're posting every one of these podcasts up on YouTube. We don't drive Perfect. any traffic from the show to it, meaning I don't, I've don't. i never told anyone before on a show that we're actually recording these and they're loaded up on YouTube. I probably should let them know. They can go <laughs> watch these episodes. Yeah, um, and then we'll yeah. get a dashboard and see how many people watched. <laughs> yeah, interestingly <laughs> enough, 50% of my listeners are listening on the desktop. So it's not really? while they're driving. Yeah, so that's pretty well, that's, interesting. That is some very interesting data. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull up, actually, I have this on my website, a backup version. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me pop over to that. We can get this financial dashboard here that uh, is a scorecard that is very basic. It focuses mm-hmm. on revenue and profit. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, one reason I'm going to do this is because for some reason, uh, Google is making me re-log in. So okay, don't want to waste time for that. But this is actually on my website. And you can go in and mess with this too for, mm-hmm. for anybody that wants to. But this is, this is Google Data Studio. And you can do this with your own internal sites too. You can just have your own dashboard and embed it on a website. Wow. So... I mean, big KPIs up here. We've got revenue, gross profit, gross margin, right. net profit, net profit margin. Mm-hmm. And we've got the trend of revenue and profit over time, mm-hmm. top 10 expenses. And as you hover over them, you get the little tool tip that pops up of what does it actually mean? Right. And then some revenue breakdown. So you've got source A, B, and C, and how that is trended for, it looks like, all of 2021 here. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go ahead and select whatever dates you want and pick whatever. and um, it's kind of cool. It makes the income statement a lot more digestible, especially for non-numbers people or non-financial people. Yeah. Um, so I've I've really liked using Google Data Studio. It's a great visualization tool. Gotcha. Um, and it, it does kind of level the playing field, which is awesome. So now Excel is not a great visualization tool, but it's a great tool for doing calculations. And do you, are you finding that most of your clients are more interested in building stuff on Excel or Google Sheets because it's the it's the most easy to easiest to share access. Most people know how to use the formulas and can change things or is that not so popular anymore? You know, I still my business is still a slight majority in Excel mm-hmm. um, and you can make some pretty cool visualizations in there, too. Um, I'll pull one up now for the YouTube viewers. Mm-hmm. Just another kind of simple financial dashboard. Whoa, look at that. Um, yeah, that, we've got some That almost looks like the other ones. Instead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never knew how to create those speedometers. That's pretty awesome. They're pretty cool. They mm-hmm. get a lot of uh, good feedback from clients. And this, to your point, it, it doesn't really feel like Excel right. when it you've got all these like speedometers and, and the KPIs. And it, it looks like an online thing. Um, so Are these actual so- widgets that people can put in? Is that... Uh, they are from they grab it from the tool box up up top um to an extent there's there's a lot of creativity involved okay but, um these are pretty standard things that uh, uh i pineapple in general our, our team offers mm-hmm. um so we'll use something like this as an example people mm-hmm. say oh i want the i want the percent to budget up here and i want the speedometer right. for profitability down here and all that stuff. yeah nice um so we're looking at forecasts, we're looking at revenue versus actual, we're looking at gross margin, we're looking at trends month mm-hmm. by month. Um, yeah, this is really nice visual presentation. Um, Thank you. And I, I think that, uh, you know, the old saying in, in sales is stories sell. Um, mm-hmm. And this sort of tells a story. Uh, right. People like to see a, a visual. So yeah, it's so that, important. I couldn't agree more. That is why I kind of dove with two feet in into dashboards for small businesses because you can see the story. If you've got five minutes before a big meeting, you can say, Oh, look, revenue was up 29%, profit was only up eight. Okay. Why wasn't profit also up 29? Let's talk about it. Right. And then there you go. Now you're into a strategy conversation. Exactly. Um, so I really like the dashboards for kind of enhancing the conversation between the consultant and coach, really. Mm-hmm. Super useful. 
Yeah. Um, now, now tell us uh, what does Tableau do? Is that like uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. It, is that a table format kind of like I use Airtable? Um, is it some kind of a look? Well, what is it exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so Tableau uh, for the YouTube viewers uh, who just saw the Google Data Studio demonstration. Tableau is very similar, but mm -hmm. Tableau is more powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, is also much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, Tableau is very good at data visualization. It is very, very intelligent. And what I mean by that is you can have a dashboard within a dashboard and sort of do the inception of dashboards kind of thing there. You can get a lot of additional analytics involved in a Tableau dashboard. But the overall goal is, again, visualize your data, make it something where you can automate the data flow and, and make it kind of fun and exciting to look at again, even for non-financial people or non data yeah, people. Super important. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about companies who struggle or are challenged by figuring out what KPIs uh, to come up with. The many companies I think find like, what should we measure? Like what does really matter? And for people who are completely stymied, um, and I'll offer this to all of our listeners, I have a list it's 560 KPIs to, to choose from. And they range from every area of your business, from customer satisfaction and employee engagement, net promoter score, to you know, operating metrics, to financial metrics, to marketing and sales metrics. Uh, you know, too many people get don't go past the marketing and sales to get to all these other metrics. But look, like I said earlier in the show, employee engagement is a huge indicator towards profitability and return on share, you know, shareholder return on their investment. Yeah. So what, what yeah. kind of things do you do to help your clients with choosing KPIs, identifying good KPIs? So it's a great question. I'm, I'm glad that you have the resource out there too, because it is it is very much necessary. Even for folks that are familiar with it and like it, it mm -hmm. can't hurt to go yep. refresh either. Yep. Um, so conversations I have, they normally start with, okay, what's the goal? Make more money, mm -hmm. you know, nine times out of 10, right? Right. Or grow or scale or something. So it's okay. Well, we could measure revenue and that's that's important, but it normally falls into the operational category. And so I work with a lot of service-based businesses and we talk, um, we talk hourly rate comes up a fair amount mm -hmm. because in the service-based businesses, obviously you don't really have um, countable inventory. You just have your time and your team's time. Mm -hmm. So we get into where are you spending your time and what is the most effective and things like that. It's kind of aligns with the goal of, okay, I'm the owner and I'm doing all this administration work, but my hourly rate is... $400 an hour, I really shouldn't be messing in QuickBooks, right? I should, I should have somebody else do that. So where you're exactly. spending your time is a big one. Yep. Um, and then kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. So if you are doing marketing, great. I mean, obviously you're probably doing some sort of marketing, but what's working best? Where should you spend your time and where should you spend your money in that? Where should you um, kind of connect with your team? So mm -hmm. team, uh, not necessarily employee engagement, but I'm sure it could be a part of that. But team scorecards, how is your team doing? How is your team feeling? Did they like the work? And if they don't, it probably reflects in their efficiency. So kind of getting back to hourly rate or just efficiency in general uh, from a company team level as well. Yeah, super helpful. So gosh, I just can't emphasize the importance of having a good set of KPIs and like set. How many KPIs should a company have? So I think there's such a thing as having too few. And I think there's such a thing as having too many. Um, yes. And so what's the right number? I think it depends upon your team. Yes. And what do I mean by team? Um, so I think the leadership team should have it set. I think each department uh, or division should have it set. That means if you have a sales department or you have a maintenance department, like it should have its own set. What's a good number? I don't know. I think a dozen is probably a good number. Um, 20 might be pushing it too much. 10 or fewer might just not be enough. Um, I think also sometimes you have to have 
maybe a few that might be overlapping mm -hmm. where you're not really sure what the best one is. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, I find that sometimes some of my clients have accounts receivable that are over 30, over 60 days. So there's a couple of different things I think you can measure. They could measure, obviously, the average days of receivable. Um, they could measure uh, the dollars over 30 days or over 60 or over 90. Mm -hmm. They could measure the percentage of accounts receivable that, uh, that are outstanding and over 30. Um, what's gonna, they could also measure like how much they're dropping that percentage over a prior period. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, so here's an example of maybe four different metrics that you could choose from. And I'm not sure which would be the right one. It would depend upon things in your business. Like, are you growing? Are sales flat? Um, what's your goal? Do you have a target to get to? So is that just pretty much consistent with your experience in terms of numbers and what things to measure? Absolutely. Yeah. For the, for the, for the audio only uh, listeners, I was nodding my head aggressively in agreement yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of classify it into primary and secondary KPIs. Mm. So maybe the primary is the dollars that are outstanding past 30 days. Right. And then the secondary is kind of the breakdown of 30, 60, 90 and the percents and things like that. So totally agree. Right. And the scorecard I use is pretty simple. It just basically color codes it red or green. The, the highlights the cell. So, you know, whether you're, I do like uh, the red, yellow, green, and super green uh, scaling up uh, created that as a community. So you could really see like how well you were doing and which ones were doing okay. So I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any more thoughts on, on KPIs and the importance and, or, you know, things you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, I could go on for days about KPIs, but <laughs> I will just, kind of double down on the comment you just made of the red, yellow, green, or anything like that. Yep. I think the number is like 65% of people are visual learners, mm -hmm. but I would guarantee that 100% of people, if they look at their scorecard and they see a big red down arrow or a big red square, that is a red flag to them and they're going to look closely at it. So Great. I, I love the use of color there. I think it's very important. Great. All right. So Jack, if people want to connect with you, or learn more about Pineapple Consulting Firm, do you recommend they go to your website, pineapplecf.com? Or That's the one. I'd say that's the best place. I'm always on LinkedIn too. Feel free to find me at either Pineapple Consulting Firm or Jack Tompkins there. But um, yeah, website is probably best. A whole lot of examples on there too, as, as we kind of went through. But um, yeah, so super, super thankful for being on, Jonathan. Thanks. Super, super thankful for your sharing and for sharing visuals. Folks go to uh, YouTube to watch the video. Um, Jack, I'm sure your journey from corporate analyst to starting your own consulting firm has been um, quite an endeavor in tracking your own KPIs and metrics. But, you know, um, like, I think we, we should eat our own dog food first to make sure that it's safe for others um, and that it's, it's, it's tried and true and tested. Right. And it looks like you're doing that. So good job. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. So folks, uh, please share this with others. KPIs really matter to driving success in your business. Thanks, Jack, so much. Thank you, Jonathan. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.